Hello. Uh, this evening's programming is about ice climbing here in the Catskill Mountains. And uh, with me in the studio at the moment is our resident ice climber, Dave McQuinney. Dave, welcome. Ice climbing is a sport that certainly is new to me, and until we were out uh, climbing on the ice, I actually had never seen it close up, nor have I ever seen it in wide world of sports or any other uh, show that might show these, these kinds of esoteric sports. How, in fact, did you get interested? Um, I think I got interested in ice through uh, general mountaineering, which I picked up in the Pacific Northwest, and that was mostly glacier climbing and mountain climbing. And ice climbing is a specific uh, pinpoints one aspect of that. And uh, in New England, uh, that's where that's where it's all at is ice. And having it in my backyard, that's uh, how I followed up with the ice climbing. Mm -hmm. Now, your actual formal instruction did that start while you were out in the Northwest, or is that something that you then pursued once you came back east? Uh, no, uh, we did some ice climbing out there, but it's a different kind of ice. It's uh, glacier ice. And it's much more like styrofoam and much uh, of a softer where you put the pick in and it'll hold a lot easier where waterfall ice is much more brittle mm -hmm. and it'll plate off and things like this. Uh, so the techniques are the same, but the uh, ice is different. And what actually causes that? It would seem that it'd be as cold in the northwest as it would get here. Uh, yeah, altitude. Out there it's glacier. Mm -hmm. And when you get down to a certain elevation, it's warm and it won't freeze. To where in New England, uh, water freezes at a very low altitude, and it becomes waterfall ice. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything akin to the glacier ice here, if one goes up high enough in the White Mountains or the Adirondacks, uh, or is that still too, too low? Yeah, I don't think there's any real glacier in, uh, in the Northeast. On the top of Mount Washington, you might come into some parts of it. We're going to uh, take a short pause here for a moment, and we'll be right back. We're back talking with uh, Dave McQuinney about ice climbing here in the Northeast. One of the things, uh, we've seen all of the equipment that you've brought and one would use on an ice climb, and also as one progresses in the sport, one learns the techniques and gains experience in its use, but it seems to me that there's another added dimension to the sport besides having the best equipment or having had the best lessons and even the most experienced climbers might sometimes find themselves in difficulty. Is that accurate? Yeah, there's always the risk of uh, objectivity. And uh, what I mean by this is the subjectivity would be all the knowledge you have, all the education you have, all the good tools you have. You can have everything going for you. And if something's going to break off uh, on the side of that wall, it's going to break off no matter what you got going for you. And that's the objectivity. And that's something that you want to keep in mind in climbing in using your techniques, you always want to keep up. Don't ever waste lag around time, log around this and that on a climb, because you want to, the least time you're on that wall, it lessens the objectivity of something breaking off or an avalanche coming down or something that's out of your control. Mm -hmm. so, so not wasting that time then doesn't mean moving, of course, at a frantic pace, but building each climber then would have his or her own pace for moving up the waterfall. Yeah, exactly. You don't, it's a very thin line where you don't want to, once you rush, uh, you're going to then um, deter the uh, uh, subjectivity. So in other words, you're going to be rushing your moves. Don't rush your moves, take your time, keep in complete control, think it completely out, but don't waste any time either. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very thin line there. You're better off going slow than rushing any time. Now, ice climbing is a sport that one wouldn't do on one's own, much like skin diving. Is, is that the, yeah. the way it's, one approaches it? Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, they do do solo climbs, and uh, I'm sure they have the reasons for it, uh, for the people who do that. I would usually climb with a partner, and um, it's funny, I, I thought about it once. Um, many of the people that I've climbed with, I don't think I know their last names, but I think I've known them for years and years and years on a first name basis. Right. On, on a waterfall, one has one's equipment, one's ability to count on, but as you've pointed out, the objectivity, the shape of the ice, the avalanches, uh, weather conditions which can change rapidly when one is at high altitudes, then the only other thing the climber has going for him or her is one's partner. 
Yeah, and in, in stressful situations, um, there is no more cosmetics on somebody's personality. Uh, you really get to know the person as the person. And there were times, uh, one time where we were in a storm up uh, off Mount Rainier, where uh, it was a complete whiteout uh, situation. Both of us were hanging on a wall and didn't know where to go. And, uh, and both of us knew that there was some kind of trouble, but neither one brought it up and just thought it out and kept it to themselves with doubt or, and things like this, or hurts and things like this, kept them to themselves. And eventually we did uh, rappel off of Ballard, which is a nice cut round circle, into a crevasse and waited out the storm in a crevasse. And both of us stayed awake all night and were very cold, but neither one of us complained about it because both of us knew that the other one knew that. <laughs> right, right. There was no sense saying that it's cold out here. On exactly, the yeah. Now, in a whiteout, which uh, is, in fact, when the land and the sky all become a white color so that one can't differentiate at all. Yeah, I, it's almost a tell difference between up and down in a situation like that. Um, it's, it's just all white and you don't know which direction you're going in. You don't really know up and down except from gravity. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a stressful situation that has to be thought out and, and patience. Now, with the whiteout, was, there was an accompanying storm which caused that? Yeah, what had blown in was a storm. And, uh, well, after the, white, after the whiteout was blown out, it was a funny situation that there's hardly any uh, lightning thunderstorms in the North Cascades because of the glaciated ice, it usually takes heat from a rock to cause the lightning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were on top of the mountain and the, and the per and thunder started getting louder and louder and lightning started coming. And of course being the antenna on top of the mountain on our razor edge uh, ridge, uh, one would be a little concerned about lightning. And one thing to keep in mind um, is the static electricity. And uh, the person I was climbing with at the time said, uh, your hat, the hair in your hat is standing straight out, and which would be a sign of static elect electricity. And he said, let's get off this ridge right away. So he plunged step down the side. And on the way down, he said, if you start to hear your ax uh, with a high-pitched noise, uh, just hold on. And uh, as soon as he finished that sentence, of course, my ice <laughs> ax started humming at a perfect E level, you know. Uh, and, and each step you took, your life went, your whole life was reflected. And, um, and still, you found out about yourself that you kept taking those steps. You just didn't lay down on the ground and give up. And you plunged step down and we dove into a crevasse and uh, stayed in a crevasse until the storm passed over. Combination, does it suit them? Okay, now there's an American, they call it International, where if you get to a spot where you can get flat-footed, okay, you can rest that foot and it can be like that. One will be French and one will be Austrian. And the Americans kind of started that. It's now called an international method. Uh -huh. So it, it does put all the, it rests this calf. Uh -huh. Where once I go up on that. Right, then you're resting the other one. Yeah, well, yeah, well, you, uh, this is a lot more strenuous on your calf. Right. So I'm just gonna go up here. And this, uh, well, this is a point of interest. This Chouinard, Chouinard invented this zero, it's called, this real short ice axe. And uh, he tested it in the Sierra Nevadas, where the snow, where the ice is a little different, it's more like alpine ice. And it works real well, except in New England, it doesn't come out as well, because this is waterfall ice. So you'll see, that when, it, oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, when it's placed, it, it's a little tougher to get out, than, and can sap some of your strength. So uh, what's, well, what I kind of found out was you just file the top a little bit more back, which makes it a little easier to come out, which some people argue about why would you want it easy to come out. <laughs> but it does sap your strength pulling that.
carabiner, uh -huh. and there's a figure eight. There's a, different, a lot of different ways you can rig up a thing to lay off or a rappel off. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, kind of nice sometimes when you're real tired and if you're climbing alpine and uh, you don't have to think. And, uh, well, real bad conditions, it's easier to work out. Less chance of making mistakes. Uh -huh. So okay. why isn't that used all the time? Because uh, you, don't, you don't need it. You can use four carabiners and rig it up. Or, uh, well, there's all kinds of different ways. Some people feel confident enough that they don't need it. I think it's repeating figure eight going out. And there's no slipping with the figure eight, is why it's used. Uh, yeah, no, figure eight's real good for shooting any sort of thing. Gee, that's a shame. I'm up about 400 feet, so you chip away. You want to place it about 15 degrees in, and you don't want to make, want to make it flush. And of course, you know, you'd be hanging like this on the wall. Sometimes if you want, for a rest, Yeah. Well, I 
I see, and it cores the ice as well. Yeah, yeah, it comes out of that hole. You have to have that coming out of there. Are uh, goggles a normal part of the equipment for times like this? Uh, not really. No. I guess if you. Uh, not really needed, but. I guess what I'll do now is just uh, climb this and I guess point out some things while I'm doing it. Okay, you're all set? All set. Oh, uh, okay, and I'm going to give you a little weight just to give you what it's like if Fine. I come off. Okay. And that so your right hand, your brake hand, you don't want to take that off. Right. Okay. Now, will you take the rope you need automatically or shall I feed you? Uh, yeah, kind of feed it out a little bit. You'll see how it goes. Yeah, I shouldn't have to pull on it. Uh, you can feed it out a little bit. I want to take in some rope. Yes, we're really sad for strength. Yes, I can see. Okay, let it out. Only oh, pulling it. So now I'm just going to go through this whole thing. Okay. I'm going to go with one tool up to here uh, and rely on my feet. And I guess what I'll do is just climb this through and then we'll go through the other stuff later. as tight as you can. Okay. And what I got here 
is an international stance, which gives me a little bit of a break. With the left foot flat. And the right toes in. And the right toes in. Now this part here, there's a bulge coming out. So I'm going to have to lean way back on my tools and go over this. Okay. Uh, did you want to try a fall once more? Yeah. Okay. Got it taught? Yeah. Okay. Got me? Yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay, is it hurt too much or no? No. Okay, and that'll be a fall. Okay, I'll get take the weight off. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So you know what it feels like. starting to go a little bit. So instead of pushing on it, let it dangle. I'm in a hollow spot right now. But I feel kind of safe with it. And I'm gonna get my legs a break and dangle from these loops. Uh -huh. Now where is the strain? Is it in your arm or just around your uh, waist? I'm kind of just dangle, it'll be around my wrist. Then I'm gonna move up. back over my feet. Scrambling. Now here I get a chance to rest again in an international and rock back whenever you get that chance. Take it. Uh -huh. and, okay, and I'll be, I'm okay now, so I'd be off the lay. Off the lay. Okay. You say that to me. Yeah, and then I, I you know. say okay and okay. you can relax. Okay. Okay, so now we can do stuff from there. Right. What I want to do. I'm just going to repel back down this. Okay. On a repel, you want to sit back and keep the feet in front of you. Yeah, the feet are what protect you from the uh, ice? Yeah, if, yeah, yeah, you'd, you'd go right in there if you want. Okay. 
Uh, what I can set up is an ice belay and hang from the wall if you want to do that. It's good to practice with your gloves on too, because most of the time you're not going to be able to take those off. So, I would tie in with a figure eight, and I would hook into this belay here. And now I am on belay. I'm off belay to you, Mike, and I'm on here. Okay? Now I can just sit back here like this. And then I would put you, put you on belay like this. And this is... Well, these aren't going to pop out. I mean, and I'm tied right into that. Now, what is this the restful position? If you... If I was sitting like this? Yeah, could, what? yeah sure. I could probably get tighter into this. It would be nice if I was a little tighter into this. That uh, would be more restful for you? Yeah, yeah, I can... Okay, so on belay now? Yeah, then it would be on belay, yeah, type of thing, yeah. Now, can you get work with a telephone company pretty easy, or...? Uh, I wouldn't mind it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then, do I have another carabiner there? I don't, I don't uh, see okay. one. Actually, you see, when you're on... A nice thing to do, too, is when you're on a nice belay like that, a lot of slings can start to get confusing. You may want to back this up if it's melting and stuff like this. So it gets confusing, so what you might want to do is take a carabiner, hook it on the side, and the rope you're coming out on, just keep that off to the side and let it run through the, you know, little tricks like that. And you pick that up as you go, because it, it, things can get confusing in front of your face, mm -hmm. and you don't want that. Those little things can, uh, let's see, over. The nice thing about the clove hitch is a lot of schools don't like to use it anymore. But one thing that's nice about it is um, it's easier to tighten up without going through a whole bunch of stuff. And it's just two loops and then over. So it's, it's your preference. See, it's easier to tighten up. You can just push that through, pull there. And then this. Well, I can show you now here. Okay, now that. Yeah, sit back just like that. Rest yourself. Put the weight here on your harness. Mm -hmm. And you would be on belay. And if I had a carabiner, I could like let it slide off there. It would keep a lot of stuff here. You may have more slings rigged up. Sometimes on glacier rice, it'll melt out. It's not as brittle. And you have to constantly put snow on and stuff like that. But you can stay right here for, you know, till spring. Put, put snow on the ice screws? Yeah, sometimes in, on, on alpine ice or glacier ice, um, it's a lot softer than this. It's more like styrofoam. And they melt out. They will melt just by this pressure of hanging here. Uh huh. That'll it, create it puts weight on there. Yeah. And sometimes what you might want to do is to cover it with snow, or just keep checking, or put a backup on it, which would be another screw out on, a, on the same angle. If that pulled out, then it would go. Two on more there. screws. Yeah. Six. If you wanted to, whatever you feel comfortable with. Type of thing. Okay. So that's a nice belay. And uh, I mean, you can, you know, you, if you were sleeping on, if you were sleeping on this thing and rigged up for an overnight thing, you would definitely want to keep checking your ice screws because this will put friction on them somehow, and they will, they will lose it. Right. See, I'm actually standing over my feet right now, and you can actually stand on those points. And that's ice knocks them out. Now, your heels got to be low, too. If my heels weren't low, I'd skid right off of that. You got me, right, Mike? Yes, I got you. with all of this, that uh, you don't pay any attention to where you are. You're just on the climb.
Okay. Uh, this is station WARK broadcasting today from the first grade classroom in Roxbury School. Ms. Terry Stewart is the first grade teacher and these are all the lovely children. The story that we're going to be telling today has a storyboard to go with it. The artist draws the pictures and then tries to use them to describe the story which the, the writer writes. They put them together and make a book. So you can look at the pictures as I go along. <coughs> the title of this story is Greypaw, The Night Everything Happened at Once. Everybody knows that a cat has nine lives, is very curious, and gets into a lot of trouble. Just such a cat was Greypaw. Long and slender, she had one gray paw, but all the rest of her body was black. And it was her job to take care of Mr. and Mrs. Compton's old house in the country. It was winter time and the moon was very full and gray paw was stalking the halls, walking down the long halls at night, doing her job and looking for mice, Yes. Adventure? Of course. Trouble? No, no. Greypaw never looked for trouble, but trouble had a way of finding her. The old grandfather clock in the living room was going tick-tock, tick-tock. And Greypaw was walking and looking and sniffing and creeping into every nook and cranny of every room with an open door. A bell around her neck announced her coming and her going. Tinkle dink, tinkle dink, tinkle dink. Mrs. Compton put the bell around Greypaw's neck during the day to warn the birds at the feeder. She didn't want any of the birds killed and Greypaw was a very, very good hunter. <coughs> well, this night, it was about one o'clock in the morning and the mice were all gathered in front of the fireplace in the living room, picking up popcorn crumbs where the children had eaten that evening. But now everybody was sound asleep. Tinkle dink, tinkle dink, the mice heard the bell and they ran for their holes, all but three. And three of them dashed underneath the grandfather clock. One of the mice ran through a knot hole up inside the grandfather clock, up the pendulum chain, causing the chain to wibble, and then he jumped onto the bell just as the gong struck one. There was no sound. The gong hit the mouse right in the head and knocked it silly unconscious, and the mouse fell plop right into the clock bottom. Well. The clock was very upset. It had never struck anything but the hour before, and now there was a little furry mouse lying in its bottom, and it was so disturbed that it stopped. It didn't tick anymore. Well, just then, Gray Paw came into the living room, one paw raised, and he was sniffing the night, and he s didn't smell anything and he didn't see anything unusual, and he didn't hear anything unusual. The other two mice were underneath the bottom of the clock. They were hiding. They weren't going anywhere. And she was drawing her attention to the clock. There was a sound that she'd never heard before. It was the silence. There was no tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. It was very, very silent. So, Greypaw put down her haunches in the rear, and she put down her shoulders in the front, and she stretched her paws out. And she dug her claws into the rug, and she brought her rear haunches up, and she started to wiggle forward, and her back was slithering like a snake, and her tail was whipping back and forth, and her ears were twitching, and her eyes were glaring at the clock. 
clock and she got closer and closer and suddenly squeak there was a loud noise someone opened the window well the loud squeaking noise woke up the mouse who didn't know where he was and he started running and he ran right into the side of the clock and knocked himself out again and just at the moment when the mouse hit the side of the clock the cat head hit the side of the clock she was catapulted into action she was going to do something right then boom and the two of them hit the clock at the same time well the clock it was so big it normally would never have felt even the slightest bit or if it had felt a little something might have felt a little tickling in the vicinity of its knees if it had been a real grandfather but it was unbalanced and it was upset and it started to teeter a little bit like this and the pendulum swung a little bit like this and the clock went over and it knocked up against the lamp and the lamp fell over crash and the clock went back the other way teetered the other way and it leaned up on great great grandfather's stuffed swivel rocking chair that he'd gotten on his 87th birthday from Aunt Bertie and it took a little turn on the rocking chair and the bottom moved around and it knocked over Aunt Tutu's end table with the flower vase on it and sent them crashing to the floor well the clock door opened up and the little mouse staggered out right underneath Graypaw's nose but Graypaw's head had gotten hit so hard that her eyes were crossed and she saw two mice and she didn't chase either one and the mouse was gone just like that and the other two mice they ran away just like that and they got into their holes and Graypaw shook her head ten times in a second and when her vision cleared there was no mice anywhere well just then the light flashed on and Mrs. Compton came in and there they looked out the window and there was Mr. Compton. He had come home and he had forgotten his key and he didn't want to wake anybody up so he was trying to be very quiet. But he woke everybody up because when the clock fell over the window crashed down on his fingers and there he was trapped outside and the cat looked through the window and she saw his face <gasps> and he was howling with pain. The little cat said, uh-oh, I'm in for it now. He looked at the mess at the clock falling over in the vase and the, the chair was all askew and the lamp was on the floor and the man was howling. But when Mr. Compton came in through the window, he was feeling his hurt fingers and he didn't even think to look at the cat or to hold Graypaw responsible for all the destruction that greeted his eyes. But you and I and Graypaw we know who was responsible. The end. Now we're going to watch our teeth. Now, now we're going to have a couple of short stories. Okay? And while we tell... Welcome everyone to WARK. I'm Christine Cordon, and today the Arkville Studios are in Delhi, New York. We're celebrating a farm festival sponsored by the Delaware County Historical Association. It's a fine growing time is the name of the exhibition. We're uh, over here near a exhibition barn that is going to be dedicated today by Senator Cook. In the exhibit as many artifacts from around the 19, excuse me, the 1850s uh, with the lives and times of the Thompson family, which lived and uh, grew produce from the uh, Delahaye Bovina area. So we're going to walk around and see some of the arts and crafts and the things that went on from day to day living with the Thompsons. We're going to go around and talk to some of our neighbors right now. We're here with Pat Reagan right now, and she's doing some basket weaving. Uh, Pat, how long have you been doing this, and uh, how did you become interested in such a thing? Uh, I've been doing it just about two years, and just loved baskets, and so wanted to learn to make them myself. Uh-huh, and uh, how did you learn how to do this? 
I had a friend whose sister teaches basket making in Pennsylvania and she came up one day and I said show me what to do and we grabbed some caning material and just went from there. Mm -hmm. And where would you get your materials? I buy it down south uh -huh, yeah. in North Carolina. I mail for it for the most part. And what type of uh, material is this? I know it's a, okay. is this reed or is it yes. wood, strips of wood? Well, it's strips of ash wood and they're called splints and I buy the, some of the handles and make other handles out of grapevine. Just, it depends on what I feel like doing that day. Uh-huh. And uh, something with the, uh, what would baskets, uh, what were the type of baskets mainly made in the 1850s? What purposes were they used oh, boy, you're mostly down for? <laughs> We have egg baskets that have a curved bottom like oops, I'm gonna ruin you. Like this that would hold eggs that they used to gather the eggs in. We have this is called an Oreo basket because it looks like an Oreo's nest. Mm -hmm. What it was actually used for I have no idea. Interesting shape. Yeah. And uh, you and have some new type ones that you invent yourself, or are these basically traditional styles most you're working of them are with? Traditional, and some it depends on the mood I'm in and the day what I'm going to do. Sometimes I just create, and sometimes I'm making, you know, a regular egg basket with certain size stays. Well, it was nice talking to you, Pat, and uh, thank you for your time. <laughs> We're here with Jennifer Stump right now, and she's giving a. a goat milking demonstration. Uh, would you go ahead and explain what, what to do here? Maybe you could get someone to demonstrate. Here, um, want to do it? Here, you do it. Okay, you know how to do it. <laughs> this, um, you squeeze and pull at the same time, like she's doing. <laughs> and that's all you really do for it. Uh -huh. Now, how old uh, are these goats when you begin to milk them? Well, usually a year old when they when you breed them, you have to breed them first before they you can milk them. How many goats do you have on your particular farm? Well, we have 11 and we're milking 3 and we have a fourth one on the way. Uh, I understand goat milk is very healthy. Is that yes. some truth behind yes. that? Where do you uh, um, where do you sell your goat milk? We don't. We drink it ourselves and we make cheese and ice cream and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And um <laughs> Well, and what's your name? Deanna. Deanna. Oakley. Are you a relative of hers? No, a no. friend. You, you seem to be doing that very well. Do you have uh, any practice at this? Yeah, I milk cows. Oh, you milk cows. So this is probably easy stuff for you, right? Mm -hmm. Or is Which is easier, milking a cow or milking a goat? Both. Both? Which do you like best? Both. Both? Okay. Thank you very much, yet, ladies. This is weights for pennies. Pennies is weights. On what? On the wiggling. <laughs> we are walking around here and we found a, a gentleman from our home area. Could you tell us your name, sir? Roman Searle from Flashman's. And could you tell us exactly what you're doing? Well, right now I'm whittling out a little red cedar horse head. And then when I get done, if you stay here a couple minutes, I'll give it to you. Uh -huh. Wouldn't that be nice? And how long have you been <laughs> whittling? Well, I, about two or three years is all. Uh-huh. This wasn't anything you started as a kid, or just no? I had to make I had to make a living when I was a kid, and they, you, know, you got so you whittling. Uh, what were you doing as a kid? Making well, uh, about flesh? everything in the Catskill Mountains that folks were lived on a farm did, and uh, they was uh, worked on a farm. Where in Fleischmann's? No, down Marketville way, and cut logs, kitted logs, worked in hay. Had bees and a little most everything. So did you do farming most of your life, or did you oh, change yeah. careers? Oh yeah. No, I didn't. Somewhere? I didn't change any. Just, I never had enough education to get out of that farming business, so I guess I was stuck with it. You've got some. Uh, <laughs> some <laughs> well, it's not all that bad. It looks great here no. today, don't you think? Well, I'm. I'm glad I came over. I don't. I get away to get her out to the holler very often. So you've got some lovely pieces here. Uh, what kind of a uh, that shoe make. Duck there, you that go. shoe make. Uh, and this is all shoe make. The base of this one is a uh, uh, Japanese U. Uh -huh. And uh, most most of the birds are the shoe make. And the chess men, of course, uh, they're. Uh, this is an, again the Japanese U, and that's a shoe make. The, they're all weighted with a penny, yes, they. Uh, the whole yeah, you have to live up in the Catskill Mountains about 70 years before you figure something like that out. <laughs> right. 
I noticed now, these are two colored woods here. Yeah, right? that's apple tree, and this is red cedar, same as this. Do you get this wood uh, locally? Oh, yeah, we gather it all. It grows right on our farm. Uh -huh. Yes, indeed. So, well, it's been a pleasure talking to well, you. Well, uh, now you, you wait just a minute, and I'll have this nice enough to take right with you. Okay. <laughs> Whereabouts you folks from? Well, I'm from Pine Hill, and Jeff is from Pine Hill. I'm right over the hill from you. You got you live right in our backyard. Neighbors. neighbors. <laughs> you live right in our backyard. Right in your backyard. Pine, yeah, yeah, we're we're just up to Birch Creek, carrying up over in the next hollow. Well, we're within walking distance. Yeah. Then. Oh yeah. I even live on Searles Road. Huh? I live on Searles Road. Oh, you do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so it must have been your old home territory at one time, huh? <laughs> Some relative. Oh, you're, you're Margaretville, Searles Road? Well, that's my brother lived there. That's where I was brought up. There well, you are. There we go. Isn't that a pretty one? It sure is. Thank you very much. <laughs> is this a souvenir? Yeah, that is. All right. Thank you very much. I'll probably get this. We're over here at the quilting tent, and there's a lot of ladies over here very busy doing some quilting. I'm going to see if I could interrupt one of these ladies and explain a little bit of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Hi. We're just going to interrupt a second here. We're uh, from Margaretville and we're interested in what you're doing here. Maybe you could explain a little bit. Is this a, a group of ladies that get together regularly? Yes, we're from the Delaware County Historical Association Quilters and we meet once a month and we all get together and do our own thing. Uh-huh. Now, and who's responsible for the designs of these quilts? We're all, we all do whatever we feel like doing. Mm -hmm. So there's nobody, we just do our own thing. Do you ever follow traditional patterns that were uh, popular in certain yes, time yeah, periods? A lot of traditional patterns. Uh, this is, this is um, tumbling blocks. It's an old pattern, very old yeah. pattern. This is triple Irish chain, which is a very old pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, what about that one over there? The uh, red, red and green that's one. That's a that's a Christmas tree skirt oh. in the Lone Star pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, above it is birds in the air, the yellow and brown. I see. That's an old pattern. And what's the name of this one down here, Lois? I don't know. I don't know what. Maybe. Sounds like it. Sounds good. <laughs> How many hours a week do you ladies uh, spend on your quilting? Oh, as much as we can. Uh, morning, morning, as noon, as and night, and in the middle of the night, a lot. What's your name? Marilyn Guy. Thank you for your time, Marilyn. You're very welcome. You're doing lovely work here. We're having fun. <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where are you from? Come on over here once. What's your name? Nick, Nick Swazo. What, what uh, farms are you? Uh, Meadowbrook Farm, Franklin, New York. And uh, you're here exhibiting some of your lovely vegetables? Yeah. Are yeah. you selling them to the public also? Yep. Yeah, yeah. uh -huh. We and got a road stand in Franklin too that we uh, sell at and this is the extra we have left over from when I grow. How large a farm do you have? Uh, we do about uh, 25 acres of vegetables and stuff. What do you concentrate mainly on? I do myself. I do the broccoli and the Muskmelons, watermelons, squash, and beans, cukes, and all the little stuff like that. Do you sell to uh, commercial markets at all? Yes. Uh -huh. where, do you, where do you take a, a load of your produce? Well, uh, they come pick it up at the farm. Uh -huh. From where? Uh, Del High. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then where would that go? T directly uh, to Del High uh, or other places? Uh, restaurants and businesses in Del High. Uh -huh. yeah. Nice talking to you, Nick. Yeah. Take care. Christine Cordell on stilts for the evening or afternoon. <laughs> Whoa, back. I went into the gravel one more time. One more time. Christine, when is the last time you've been on stilts? I don't have them right. I don't have them right? Well, let's get a demonstration going here. Show me what I'm doing Cross. wrong. Do it. All I can do is go backwards. Stilts are supposed to be get behind on these you. Things. Behind me. Oh, all right. We got it down now. This should be easy. Come on, did you, can you do it? Let's see you do it. Let's see you do it. Come on, let's go. There you go. Oh, boy. He's got it. All right, I'm ready for you now. Let's get him going. I'm ready for you. There you are. Ta-da. 
We did all right. <laughs> but it is. Oh, yeah. We're here by some kind of a machine. I'm going to ask this gentleman, what's your name? Ivan Mauer. Ivan, tell us what this is here. Well, this is a gasoline-powered churn of about 1910. And we, of course, don't have the milk or the cream to churn, but we are have water in it and have it in action. Is this from the uh, Thompson farm? No, uh, it is not. Uh huh. Is this a piece of your own equipment? A piece you, of my own equipment. That yes. you bring around and demonstrate to, yes. uh, to places? Yes. What's the year on this piece? About 1910. Uh huh. About the same time uh, Model T Fords were being driven around yes. the country? Y yes. Clippers. Yes. So the same kind of motor? <laughs> uh, well, it uses a Model T spark plug. But Does it really? Yeah, yes. yes. To get it going? Yes. And uh, how much production could they have expected out of a from this piece of equipment if they ran it all day? How much butter could they gotten? Oh my an gosh! Uh, in the hundreds of pounds. Uh huh. Uh, you know, if they had the amount of cream. Was this used by only the most modern farms of the time? Yes. Well, the other people were still doing it yeah, by, by hand, hand, right? Crank, by a crank. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Yes. Good. Thank you. I'm walking around and I spotted some beautiful horses. I'm going to ask this lady to tell us something about them and what her name is. Hi, I'm Marjorie Rockefeller and uh, these are registered Belgian horses that we have and we're here to do a little plowing today. Uh huh. Where are you from Marjorie? We're from just five miles up the road here, Elk Creek. Do you raise these horses yes. from uh, the times they're, they're colts? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. yes. And where do these horses, uh, you said they're Belgium, but where do you get them in this country, this type of horse? Well, you can get them all over. They're very popular. We uh -huh. bought, uh, well, most of ours that we have bought, we bought in Columbus, Ohio. They have the Eastern Regional Draft Horse Sale there. And then uh, the others we've raised. We've got 12 horses now and one next month. And who's responsible for training them? My husband and I. We both uh -huh. do it. Is it difficult to get these horses, or do they have a natural ability towards this kind of work? Well, it's not really difficult, but you've got to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, where do you get all this, uh, these harnesses and equipment that... Uh, you know, I mean, plowing isn't yeah. that common anymore. <laughs> oh, well, you can buy anything for the draft horse because uh, the Amish still work, and, and you can buy all kinds of new equipment. You know, uh, in Ohio, they, uh, they have big shops where they make everything. We was on a tour there last year, and it's amazing. Is this the same horse the Amish still use today, this type of horse? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. In fact, we bought one when we was out there last year, bought another one. Now, when I first came up, I don't know that much about horses, but I thought it was a Clyde's tail. Now, yeah, everybody closely... thinks, no, they're not related. They're all draft horses. There's Clydesdales, these are Belgians, there's Perchins, there's uh, Suffolks, there's Shires. They're all draft horses. Like in the light horse breed, there's Arabs, Morgans, um, Standard Breds, Searle Breds, like that. They're all light. These are all draft. Okay, we're looking forward to the uh, horses demonstration. Okay. Thank you very much. It'll be in a few minutes. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. last winter, so I haven't gotten horses yet. Oh, you sold the horses, huh? Yeah, I make the harness for them. We've got some interesting, uh, I guess you'd call them replicas. Is that what they are? Or well, are these little toys? Well, no, they're uh, back when we used to have them. Uh -huh. They're real things. The uh -huh. horses and uh, when we drawed milk with a wagon, we drawed hay on the wagon like that one, on my hand. Uh -huh. Before the bailers come out, and we went to town with a buggy and a horse. And uh, these pictures is all antique cars that they don't make anymore. Did you make these little vehicles here? These little, yeah, I make, yeah. Uh, well, not the cars, uh -huh. them is pictures. Right. But I just make a frame, but the rest of them I make. And what's your name, sir? Uh, Raymond Lewis. Where are you from? From uh, you? Walton. From Walton? Yeah. And you bring your exhibition around to different uh, uh, county fairs and things? Well, too? I haven't too much yet. Uh -huh. I've only been about two years at it. Uh-huh. And, uh, but I, uh, I'm proud of my work, though. 
Very and nice. uh, at, uh, I bring them out for just for show, you know. I don't really want to sell them because I like fun. them, man, just, just for keepsakes. Well, you keep uh, making more and more. <laughs> well, I'm in the process now of making a stagecoach, and I want to put four horses on that. Oh, yeah? And, uh, but I haven't got that one done yet. Well, good luck to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. We're going to close up today. Christine Cordon here over in Delhi at the Delaware County Historical Association. It's a fine growing time. Stay tuned. We'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. Okay. Here comes Jeff Jern. Give me a hello, Jeff. Hi, Christine Cordon from WARK. We're privileged to have Senator Charles Cook here with us today. How are you doing today, Senator? Very well. It's a great day, a good summer day, and a great day at, uh, for Delaware County as the museum is opening a new phase of its operation. We just were privileged to hear Senator Cook talk about the agricultural development in uh, Delaware County. He mentioned uh, something I thought was interesting, how the uh, development from the small farm to the corporate farm. Um, I was wondering, who owns these corporate farms, Senator? Uh, many of them are owned by outside interests. I say many. We really only have two or three at this time, but I suspect that as time goes along, we're going to see more development of corporate farms. Uh, there, are, there is some concern over this, of course, because there's have been people who have feared that uh, outside ownership would not have the same interest in the county as a whole as the people who live here. But our experience up to this time has been pretty positive. Uh, they've provided employment, they are using uh, modern methods of agriculture, and they are bringing a, a considerable amount of new economic strength into the county. Uh, embryo uh, development is one of the things of breeding dairy cattle and exporting them for very considerable amounts of money. And, of course, in the process are hiring people who live in the county and do provide a, an economic base. So uh, while we have some concerns that the family farm is, uh, is in trouble, perhaps, uh, I don't think agriculture, per se, is going to fade out of this county. Mm -hmm. Senator, another question I have is uh, how do you feel the, uh, the future of the Catskills stand up with some of these major landholding companies that are coming in? Well, I think the localities are going to have to face up to the situation. Uh, certainly there are changing conditions. Um, we've gotten along pretty well. As I, as I indicated in my remarks, the population of Delaware County today is almost exactly what it was in 1850. So that we've not had the real growth that creates problems. But if we start seeing uh, a 10 percent uh, growth every decade, so that by the end of this century we may have uh, 50, 60,000 people. We're going to have to be more concerned about sewage and water supplies and where the roads go uh, so that we can deal with this population well. Uh -huh. uh, kind of jump in the middle of the river here. Are you going to be going to the Republican convention, Senator? No, I'm not going. Uh, I have uh, other things that are keeping me busy. Uh, frankly, conventions don't terribly interest me. I, may have at some point been attracted by it, but right now uh, I can think of other things I'd rather do. Who could we look for as a keynote speaker there this year? Your speculation on it. Uh, I, I really, I don't know who they are even considering. Um, of course, uh, my favorite memory is that of Mark Hatfield when he make it, made his speech there a few, a few conventions ago. I thought it was one of the outstanding keynote speeches I'd heard, and uh, I wouldn't feel badly if he were the choice. Uh -huh. Well, with this new development on the Democratic ticket with uh, Jerry Ferrara, how do you think Reagan's chances are? Well, I don't think it changed Reagan's chances substantially. I think initially there will be a lot of discussion, and there will be some people speculating that it will gain votes and others saying that it will lose votes. But uh, it, historically, we have shown through the, all the years that uh, people make their choice based on the presidential candidate. They really don't anticipate that the vice president is going to be uh, become the president, even though it happens in a remarkable, <laughs> with remarkable, remarkable regularity. I think some, something like five times in this century. But I, I think that people will really make their choice based on who is the at the head of the ticket, and uh, the impact I think will be minimal. Well, how would you feel personally with a uh, lady vice president? 
I wouldn't feel uh, badly with uh, a, a lady vice president. I, I have no qualms about that. I am not sure that uh, this particular candidate has an awful lot to recommend her, other than the fact that she is a, a charming and apparently a, a, an intelligent woman. But she does not have a great deal of depth or background. Um, there are a lot of people, a lot of women in the country who do have. Elizabeth Dole, for example, uh, has been cited frequently as an excellent president. And I would be pleased to support Elizabeth Dole for president. But uh, I, I think that, um, uh, and I don't want, really want to repeat the claims about tokenism, but there is a, a, a sense in which uh, it did appear that Mondale was out saying, well, we've got to have a woman, almost any woman will do. And I don't mean to reflect unfavorably upon Mrs. Ferraro, but I'm not sure that he went out and said, who is best able to take over the job of President of the United States in the event that I'm not able to complete my term, which is really what you're supposed to be doing when you pick a vice president. Mm -hmm. Jumping subjects again, mm -hmm. uh, you're involved with the Regents Action Plan. Could you yes. tell me a little something about that? Well, the Regents Action Plan, of course, uh, hopes to upgrade education throughout New York State. It is a particular challenge to the smaller rural schools, and I will be traveling to Washington uh, in about two weeks to talk with the Education Department about one program that we hope to launch in this area, uh, Interreactive uh, Television Network, which would bring uh, numbers of students from a variety of schools into one classroom, if you will, so that we can offer classes such as uh, Russian or advanced mathematics to give our kids uh, a chance equal to what they would have in a larger suburban school district. Mm -hmm. One more question mm -hmm. for you, Senator. I live over in uh, Margaretville area. I, uh, rumor has it over there that the state's trying to phase out Bel Air Mountain. What's uh, your reaction on that rumor? <laughs> well, the governor, of course, did try to close it this year. Uh, we have put a lot of pressure on him. Uh, I personally favor uh, turning Bel Air over to a public operating authority, which I think would guarantee Bel Air, would give it the flexibility to give more economic impetus to the area, would uh, be able to be more creative in terms of uh, some of the things they do in cooperation with the general public, but most importantly would let us take the revenues that we get out of Bel Air and put it back into improvement of the slope, which is something that has not happened in the past. Uh, we've made money on Bel Air, and then the money has gone off and gotten used someplace else. And I think if we had an operating authority, the money would belong to the authority, and that's a, a key element as far as I'm concerned. Senator, on a personal level, where are you from? Where's your home base? Uh, I live in Delhi. I have lived here for nearly 20 years, and before that, I was in Deposit, which is also in Delaware County. Uh -huh. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and thank you for your time. Thank you very thank much. You, Senator. Thank you. Hi, this is Christine Cordone with WARK. We're here at the Arkville Circus. It's the All-American Old Time Circus. And I'm going to uh, introduce you to a couple of the performers that we saw today. Wendy and Walt, father and daughter act, acrobatics. And I'm going to uh, say hello to both of them. Walt, how are you doing? doing? Christine. And how Wendy. Hello. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your backgrounds? Well, yeah, where you started and <laughs> her background comes from me, of course, being that she's my daughter. Yeah, I've so been in we'll, it all my life. we'll start with me. Uh, I started in acrobatics when I was a kid, too, but uh, non professionally. And I went to school as a gymnast, went to the University of Iowa, and, and uh, was a national champion in trampoline and tumbling. That's my background. So then I got with a family of zucchinis and uh, caught a flying trapeze act and did acrobatics with them. We, uh, my wife and I did the human cannonball act with uh, Ringling and uh, zucchinis in particular. We was with Ringling for six years. And then Wendy came along. Well, I had two daughters. This is the youngest one. Wendy is the youngest one. So uh, the oldest daughter is doing trapeze. She's in the business too, but she's on the West Coast, just come from Japan uh, with a show over there. So Wendy stayed with me, and we formed this little uh, acrobatic act. And uh, she's been bouncing since she, uh, doing acrobatics since she was five years old. Uh -huh. So Wendy, how is it you've been brought up in the circus since you were born? Yeah. And yeah, uh, sure could you does. tell us for a little bit about uh, maybe some kids out there would like to know what it would like to be brought up in a circus, other than having to go to school nine to five, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's a hard question. You. 
travel a lot, travel all over the place, you get to see a lot of different places. You don't go to school regularly, you do correspondence through mail and stuff like that, but you have a lot of friends and it's a lot of fun too, so I've enjoyed it. Well, how many hours of training a day have, has your father uh, rigu rigorously put you through? Well, we used to <laughs> practice two to, you know, about two hours or so a day, but now that we got the act down a little bit better, we usually just take it about one hour. That's all it takes for the day. Do you have to depend on the circus being set up to use your apparatus, or do you have I apparatus? Have, I have stuff that I don't have to depend on anything. I can just put something up and... Is that a, a home base that you work out of? Do you have a, a place that you call home? Yeah, it's in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that you uh, recently got married. Is that Are you the right one I got? Yes, that's yeah. me. That's me. I'm married to the guy who does trampoline and comedy car. Uh -huh. Can I ask, did you get married at the circus? No, not at the circus. We didn't do that. Some people do, but I decided I didn't want to do that. So There we go, the next generation of Wendy and Walt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you soon. We'll see you out in the ring. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. We're here with another circus family. I've got Charlie right here. Charlie, what's your last name? Van Buskirk. And uh, where are you from, Charlie? We're New York State natives. Uh, I guess most of us in the family were born in Rochester. We live about 100 miles south of there now, down in the Finger Lakes country. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long have you been a ringmaster? I've been a ringmaster on and off for about uh, 22, 23 years. Mm -hmm. What other circuses have you worked with? Oh, quite a few. Uh, we prefer to be freelance artists and uh, not go too long with any one show, but we've been with King Brothers Circus, with Hammond Morton, with uh, uh, Royal International, a number of shows around, mostly the Northeast. We prefer to stay home with a price of gas the way it is now. We don't want to get too far away from home base. Uh, and uh, your girls here, uh, what are their names and ages? Andrea here is 14 and Alex is 6. Uh, and they're included in your uh, unicycle right. act, is that right? Now, right. How, did, uh, how did you become interested in the unicycle? Was that after the Ringmaster? That was long or before the Ringmaster. Before? I, was, uh, I was practically born on a unicycle. My father was a, a vaudeville act and he put me in his act when I was three and I've been doing it ever since and the, the, the announcing and Ringmaster work came later. Uh -huh. And uh, where was your father uh, based out of doing uh, Detroit originally and then the Rochester area. How did you like working with this uh, small, small type circus here? Well, it's small in, in uh, size, but certainly not in quality. It's uh, about as fine a little show as I've ever had the pleasure of being connected with. It's, there's no throwaway acts on this show. There's no time fillers. Every act is a feature. It's a one ring show. It's sort of patterned after the, the, the old one ring circus and the days before the American circus had uh, the equipment to carry three rings. And I don't know if you're familiar with the works of Walter Edmonds, uh, such as Chad Hanna, but uh, that was set almost in this area, as a matter of fact. And this show makes me think of that sort of show, the old one ring, smaller top. And uh, th there's a quality to it that you, you just can't get with a bigger show. There's an intimacy with the audience close, and it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I want to question, you do a great job at what you do. Uh, did someone train you or did you decide, hey, I think I'm going to be a ringmaster because I speak in the right tone. You've got the right quality voice for a ringmaster. Well, thank I you, but I made no decision whatsoever. I was with a little circus uh, where the ringmaster left rather suddenly and everybody else on the show was either in clown makeup or had an accent that you could cut with a knife. And I didn't really want to do it, but they tried the red coat on me and it fit like it had been made for me. and they put a whistle in one hand and the microphone in the other and kicked me out there and I wound up doing it. And one thing led to another, a few more little accidents like that and pretty soon it occurred to me as so well, as long as I'm going to do it, I might as well get paid for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like to just ask you one thing. How do you like being here at Arkville? Oh, it's, real, it's a nice town. <laughs> do you think that you'll be uh, with the circus in 10, 15 years from now? Oh, it's hard to say right now. <laughs> it's hard to say. What are your, do you have other interests than, uh, what are some of your your hobbies or interests that you have outside circus life? I like, I like to ride horses and I'm looking towards uh, veterinary school. Uh -huh. so. Very good. And how about you, honey? Do you think you'll be with the circus when you get a little older? Yeah. yeah. Do you like what you're doing now with the unicycle or do you think you might pick another field in the circus when you get older? What's your what's your favorite thing in the circus? When you just go to sit and watch, what do you say? Gee, that's my favorite thing. What's your favorite thing? The horses and the elephants. You think you'd like to train some of those animals someday? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you. The second part of the show is just about to begin. Come on in.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. With that attraction, we conclude this premiere edition of the Old Time All-American Circus. On behalf of the Delaware and Ulster Railroad, our producers, Alfred and Joyce Bidbell, and our entire staff and cast, we'd like to thank all of you for being here and wish you a very pleasant good afternoon. Thank you. What a great show. I'm going to let Journey and Shane ask some of their friends on their way out, see what they thought of the circus. Chad, come on over here. Hi. How did you like the circus? Pretty good. It was excellent. What was your favorite part? The elephants. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Can we ask you how you like the circus? It was fabulous. <laughs> I've been three times. Uh, <laughs> what was your favorite part? The elephants. Thank you very much. We got another fella here. Did you like the circus? Yes. What was your favorite part? Hmm, the guy on the um, tightrope. Thank you. Well. Shane, how about you ask someone? Sir. Hi, how did good. you like the circus today? Very good, very good. What was your favorite part? They all were good. Okay. Let's ask this They're young lady right here. Hi, the how, how did you like the circus today? Fine. What was your favorite part? Hmm. That girl going on those um, uh, rounds, whatever they're called. And I don't know. The rings? What... Yeah. Here's one for you, Shane. What's your name, honey? Brian. Brian. Did you like the circus today? Yeah. What was your favorite part? The clowns. <laughs> the clowns. How about you, sir? Oh, yeah. What was your favorite part? I guess the acrobats, they do the hardest work, I think. There you go. From WARK, we're at the circus, the old-time All-American Circus. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.